coming up on the program. I'm very happy that, uh, you know, I booked this guest uh, when we thought we were going to be talking about sanctions and potentials. And now that uh, Russia has a, uh, waged a full out assault on the Ukraine, I'm very happy to have this national security expert and distinguished fellow from the Quincy Institute of Responsible Statecraft. Joe Serencion is joining me in this interview segment. Stay tuned. <laughs> Joe Serencion, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure, Juliana. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we have some very important and serious issues to discuss, given the fact that uh, Russia has uh, uh, started an all-out attack on the Ukraine. You are a, a national security expert, and your your area of expertise is uh, nuclear proliferation, or hopefully non <laughs> non proliferation, which is what we want. Can you talk about the nuclear aspects of uh, what we're facing here, not only between Russia and Ukraine and the U.S., but as really a world, a, a, a world who would be affected by any kind of nuclear disaster there? I would say we have enough to discuss, discuss just with U.S. and Russia. If you are frightened by this moment, I would say you're having an appropriate response to this. Uh, President Biden just said this was a very dangerous moment for Europe. I would say it's a very dangerous moment for, for all of us. We have not been this close to a war between two nuclear armed states since the early 80s. Now, the US and Russia are, are not fighting now. That is true. But Russia has just launched an invasion of a country on the doorsteps of NATO. And in his speech, he threatened much more than that. President Biden was absolutely right in his news conference today. Putin's aims go beyond Ukraine. He's talking about restoring control over all the former Soviet republics, including the Baltic states, which are now members of NATO. Mm -hmm. And if those countries are indeed threatened, the U.S. has a defense uh, responsibility to come to their aid. And that's just the intentional use of nuclear weapons. There, there are two set of circumstances that worry me, and I'll go through them quickly, and then we can discuss. One is what hap happens if Putin starts to lose this war, if he's if he's faced with defeat. That's going to be a defeat, not just of a battle, not just of a war, but possibly of his control over Russia, possibly of him personally. It could all come crumbling down. Under those circumstances, he is going to be tempted to use nuclear weapons, and he has about 6,200 of them, mm -hmm. uh, to try to stem, stem that defeat. In fact, the Russians have a, a strategy, a doctrine called escalate to de-escalate, that under a situation where Russian forces were losing, the doctrine goes, they would use a nuclear weapon to demonstrate the seriousness of the situation and cause their adversary to back down. Mm -hmm. Would Trump, would would Putin use that if he does, the U.S. response is not going to be to do nothing. U.S. doctrine indicates that we would respond in kind to prevent a foe from um, achieving escalatory dominance, as they say. And the second, of course, is the, the danger you always faced with when, when a nuclear armed country is in combat. The fog of war could lead to misunderstandings, miscalculations, the, 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 a panicked use of a tactical nuclear weapon which could then quickly escalate out of control. Once one nuclear weapon is used, there is no clear fire break. There's no clear stopping point from further nuclear use. So yes, although I, I wouldn't say the chances of this are high, they're what we call, it's not a non-zero possibility. They're, they're, it's there it's, and it's closer now than it has been at any time since the 1980s. And that's part of the reason you're starting to see uh, hundreds and thousands of people start to take to the streets, both in Moscow, where they're protesting the war, and in Europe, where crowds are coming out saying, stop this war. We haven't seen this kind of activity in quite a long time. Um, let, let's talk about the fact that in the news, it's being reported today that uh, Russian forces are going after and around the Chernobyl nuclear disaster site. Have you read anything about that? And can you comment on it? 
that is one of the strangest things that, that occurred today. I don't know why Russia is interested in seizing that site. It is a radioactive wasteland. It is fenced off from the rest of Ukraine. Remember, when that disaster happened, and if anybody saw the HBO special, this was a terrifying moment in Soviet history. When that happened, it was controlled by the Soviet Union. Well, since the breakup uh, of the Soviet Union in 1991, it's under the control of Ukraine. But it is a, a radioactive wasteland. There are Nobody's permitted within tens of miles of the site. The site itself is sealed with a concrete sarcophagus because we didn't know what to do with the waste. This was a nuclear meltdown that, we, that couldn't be controlled. There was no way to take it out, to sort of clean it up. It was just sealed. But for some reason, Putin's forces have seized it. It's unclear why. I mean, I, I people are concerned about nuclear arms and nuclear war. But my understanding is the Ukraine is home to several nuclear reactors. And and to me, it just seems like if he if Putin is going after Chernobyl, if he opens up the c cement dome or whatever you just called it, that could be. Um, just as damaging as launching a strike. No, but it is damaging. Uh, I mean, what if he what if he launches a strike into one of the nuclear reactors? This is not good. Oh, oh, okay. Then you might. Have, well, that. I mean, if you intentionally sabotage a, a nuclear reactor one way or the other, that could lead to an enormous emission of radiation. That would be extremely dangerous. Yes. It still pales in comparison to a nuclear explosion. Which doesn't, which radiation release is one of the byproducts of the explosion, the blast, the heat, the fire. So, okay, thank terrible. you. That somehow Not makes me feel better, even though it's still <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Joe, um, talk about the fact that 18 days after President Donald, former President Donald Trump lost the election, he and Mike Pompeo withdrew from the Open Skies Treaty. Can you talk about? I mean, uh, there was a letter that that showed that both Trump and Pompeo knew withdrawing from this treaty would only benefit Russia and would allow Putin to invade the Ukraine. It does suggest that this has been a long term plan with some complicity from uh, our own former leaders. You know, this is a very interesting point, Juliana. Um, we we want to go look back at what Trump did in those four years and the number of agreements he withdrew from that benefited Russia more than we did. There was the INF Treaty, the treaty that Reagan and Gorbachev negotiated banning intermediate range nuclear forces in Europe. Uh, Russia was cheating on it, which is true, but instead of enforcing it, Trump tore it up, pulled out. And that has allowed uh, Russia to start developing longer range missile systems that now factor into this. He's talking about moving some of these w weapon systems into, uh, into European uh, Russia, which could threaten the European countries. And the second is this open skies agreement. This is, was an Eisenhower idea. And it basically allowed airplanes from the participating countries, there are about 30 members of this pact, including most of our European allies, allowed them to fly over Russia and for Russia to fly over Europe to observe military deployments for exactly the reasons we're just experiencing now, to avoid misunderstanding, to, to see what the other side was up to, Trump pulled out of it. He called it an obsolete force. We would like to have that now. We have satellites. The U.S. has satellites that can compensate for much of that uh, surveillance capability. But a lot of our allies don't. They greatly benefited from the intelligence. Uh, it, it certainly allowed Putin to mask his intentions for longer than he otherwise could have. Yeah. I mean, he had 20,000 or however many thousand troops at the border. And he's like, I am doing nothing. You know, he, oh, and now he's saying, of course, this is just about the Ukraine. I really haven't heard in the mainstream press uh, people talking about how his intentions are really to annex, uh, further annex uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Well, Eastern Europe. It's, it's in his speeches. I mean, if, if your but, listeners have not read some of those speeches, go Google it, go look for text, transcript, Putin, Ukraine, and you'll pull it up. It, it is quite a remarkable statement. And he goes through a long list of historical grievances. And one of those grievances is the breakup of what he insists were rightfully part of Russia. He does cons doesn't consider these republics, Ukraine, Belarus, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, as truly independent countries. He considered these rightfully Russian, and he wants to reclaim them.
what a cause manner of insanity would someone with 6,000 or so uh, nuclear weapons fight with someone? We have, what, 5,000 some odd nuclear weapons. I mean, it would be mutual destruction on an enormous scale. They're not going to win if it's mutual destruction. I don't. Could you explain to me how these leaders are thinking and, and what they're thinking? And there's two a- aspects to this. And one is uh, what's happened just in the past 10 years. Y- you've seen a return in, in Russia and in the United States to some of the doctrines we had during the Cold War, where we felt that the NATO forces couldn't withstand uh, a determined Warsaw Pact invasion. So we plan to use nuclear weapons early in that conflict to destroy invading Soviet tank armies streaming through the Fulda Gap, streaming into what was then West Germany. Uh, we abandoned all that. We created a much bigger fire break between conventional conflict and, and nuclear conflict. And that has been erased over the last 10 years uh, because this theory of integrated deterrence, and if President Biden issues his nuclear posture review in the next couple of weeks, you'll see that term integrated deterrence. And what it means is developing a a continuity between use of conventional force, cyber weapons, and nuclear weapons. These are all designed to enhance deterrence, as the theory goes, so that the foe will know that there is no no advantage in defeating your conventional weapons because these other weapons are standing ready to to back them up. (laughs) The flip side of that is you're erasing the firebreak between conventional and nuclear. So you're making it more likely that we'll use nuclear weapons. And we've been developing nuclear weapons for expressly that purpose, lower yields to make them more usable. So not a giant hydrogen bomb that would destroy a city, a smaller atomic bomb bomb that would destroy a port or a, a tank column. And and there are several of these were started by, um, by uh, President Trump a sea launch cruise missile, a new air launch cruise missile, putting low yield tactical warheads on our subs for precisely this, supposedly to enhance deterrence. But when you get in a conflict like this, you see what a slippery slope it is. And you can see how Russia or the United States might end up in a conflict where they just say, well, look, we've already uh, destroyed so much. What's a little more? And the, the, the second risk on this is the risk of accident. I'm not intending to use a nuclear weapon, but in the fog of war, in the heat of battle, of uh, feeling so desperate that you, by misunderstanding, miscalculation, or madness, you start using a nuclear weapon. And once you start using one or two, all our war games show there's no clear fire break. There's no clear place where you stop using nuclear weapons. You keep thinking one more nuclear strike will end it. It doesn't. That is not a, an uplifting way to uh, start my afternoon, Joe, but I do. <laughs> well, if, if we get through this, and I, I, you know, I believe there's a reasonable chance we will, it really is going to be a moment for us to rethink how we got here. What was it about our policies, whether it was NATO expansion, not moving quick enough to reduce nuclear weapons, not engaging more strongly on, on nuclear arms talks? abandoning these nuclear guardrails that were erected during the Cold War, thinking we no longer needed them. Let's revisit all that and think about what we could have done better to prevent us from getting to this potentially disastrous moment. So you suggest that now is not the time for the left to uh, just talk about why we should end NATO at this moment. We have to deal with the crisis first. Am I right? Oh, oh, absolutely. I'm I'm a fan of, of NATO. I don't think we should have expanded NATO, but I think it has been the most successful military alliance in history, but it has to change. It's now time to to change it. And I would really caution against some of the talk you're already hearing in Washington today about putting, getting Finland in NATO, getting Sweden in NATO, expanding NATO right up to even further up to the borders of Russia. If you thought the NATO expansion of the 1990s incited nationalist paranoia in Russia, imagine what that would do. That's where you got to rethink this and whether it's better to expand and strengthen the European Union, a non-military alliance, rather than one that that exists solely for the purpose of um, military force against Russia at this point. 
you've been following this and in the trenches with this for years and years and years. Um, can you give us an idea of what you think President Biden's best moves would be at this point? And is he doing those? I think Biden is handling this as well as anyone can handle this. This is this is a very smart response. Number one, preserve unity. Everything he's doing, he is consulting closely with our allies. Keep everybody together. That is our biggest asset against Russia. What's Russia's alliance? Belarus. That's it. What about China? I thought he was not an alliance, but a partnership. But okay. even China, if you read their statements, they are staying away from this. They're not advocating this. They're not secretly backing this. This is not in their interest to provoke a war with, with Europe. That's not in their economic, strategic, any kind of interest. You know, they'd like to calm things down. Uh, so number one, unity. N number two, he really has a quite capable national security team from, from Secretary uh, um, Biden, um, <laughs> Blinken, Jake Sullivan, they're handling this very smoothly, very few leaks. Look at how cleverly he released U.S. intelligence on Putin's moves. Things that some people, including the Ukrainians, thought was hysterical last week. Mm. Spot on. He was he, and he's letting Putin know we're inside you. We know you've issued the order. We understand what's going on. Don't think you can surprise us or outflank us with some clever you know, chess-like move. V very clever. And then today, you know, he's releasing an, more sanctions. Not everything. He's still holding something in reserve. I think that's smart. But really hard-hitting sanctions, again, unified with our European allies and our, our, our close partners around the world. Very, uh, we should be thankful that we got Joe Biden there, certainly compared to our last president, who would who's been praising Putin. Donald Trump's been out there praising Putin's smart move to invade Ukraine. And a big part of the Republican Party and the Republican um, uh, media personalities are going along with them. Biden is holding the course, standing firm, keeping everybody united. Smart moves, smartly done. Oh, gosh. Well, you're actually making me feel better. <laughs> I mean, for as much as, as you could. And, and and by the way, and he's also drawn a very a clear red line that some in Washington don't like. We are not going to put U.S. troops into Ukraine. We're not going to do it. And you know Washington, man. The first reaction to something like this is more military. Let's, we have to go tougher, stronger. That's their very first reaction. And you're going to hear a lot of that over the next week or so. Biden's in, not in that camp. No. We are, the la and the last thing the Joint Chiefs want is to have U.S. forces fighting Russian forces. You want to get close to World War III? That's how you do it. There's a reason we haven't done that uh, in, in 77 years. Arms manufacturers tend to uh, pr uh, profit greatly when war happens, but it seems like nuclear war, and this one is so close to that, I don't see how they would have a war without, after what you've said, um, not, again, by accident or by... Uh, all of the things that this you are. Of madness. This exactly. is John Kennedy. He warned us in 62 at the UN that we hang under, we, we are under the nuclear sword of Damocles hanging by a slender thread that could be cut by miscalculation, accident, or madness. Madness would be anyone who pushed a button on purpose. That would be the yeah. madness part, right? Yeah. <sighs> oh boy. Um, and what are the odds that this sort of interaction, what are the what are the ripple effects that the interaction in Ukraine are having to other um, nuclear armed states? We haven't seen anything yet. Haven't seen anything yet. You know, we, we, you, you'll be looking, obviously, uh, Britain and France, um, both nuclear armed members of NATO, China, of, of course, India, Pakistan, India uh, is... is Said they called Putin, that Modi, the leader of uh, India, called Putin and said he urged restraint. China's urging restraint on all parties. That's the standard cop out. No, no. Um, n n everybody's waiting to see how this plays out. No, no obvious moves by any of the nuclear armed states yet. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much There's for coming on. Good news, by the way, while all this is happening over in Vienna, we're getting closer to restoring the deal that 
constrained Iran's nuclear program. It looks like we might have a, a final text agreed to by next week, and that will resolve one of the big the proliferation problems, stopping Iran, Iran from getting a bomb, shrinking their program again, putting it under lock and key, correcting the damage that Trump did, this could, and reducing conflicts uh, and, and tensions in the Middle East. This will, could be a big win for President Biden. Just on, on national security, it's terrible what's going on in Ukraine. It's a lot better what's going on in the Iran deal. In terms of politi politics for Biden, I think this is going to be um, uh, some, some difficult uh, crisis weeks for him, but he could emerge much stronger than when he went in. Thank you so much, Joe Serencioni. Don't forget to follow Joe's work. His, his Twitter handle is right below here, Serencioni. But you can also follow his work at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Thanks so much. You know, I thought we were going to be talking sanctions. And then all of a sudden, you're here on the exact day that I needed you. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on.